So we always start these conversations with the same question, which is, where did you come from? What's your background, and how did it kind of make you who you are today? Small questions to start off with. Yeah, easy ones. Um, great. Well, um, you can probably uh, tell by the strange accent. I'm, I'm not from here. Uh, from Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, so that's where that's where I was born. Grew, grew up to the age of 17. Um, and at 17, I decided not to study locally, so I went down south to, uh, go to go to Oxford, the University of Oxford, to study po philosophy, politics, and economics. So in terms of sort of early days upbringing, um, definitely much sort of this Scottish capital, just on the on the south side near the hills. Um, and then, uh, yeah, enjoyed a sort of a, a jack of all trades, a master of none university degree, sort of three subjects, and didn't really know what I was I was going to do until uh, uh, till it's till it's still I sort of left left there and, and, and actually still don't know, still still working it out. <laughs> Did that background of the jack of all trades help you as your career progressed in executive roles and in entrepreneurial roles? I, I think so. I mean, quick short, I mean, who here sort of studied sort of the social sciences and humanities? So, so yes, yeah, so, so I, I think, I, I don't know, I don't know about you guys in the room, but as, as an entrepreneur, I, I tend to find people that have got that. And then the other, the other piece, I, I, I think that what helps an, uh, an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial spirit uh, with the humanities is very much, you know, studying about the people that are around you that you have to share this, uh, this planet with. Um, and you become very aware of that as part of your discipline. So, so I, I think it, it, it did help. I think the philosophy, politics, and economics mix was nice because the sort of it makes your brain switch even within the week between, I don't know, moral philosophy and, and ethics, and there's an essay there on a Monday, and then there's something about the oil crisis of the 70s for microeconomics or something, you know, by Friday, and that idea of the of, of the brain sort of uh, moving around uh, has been very useful, I think, since. Um, uh, so, so, so yes, I think, I think, I think it has been. And there was an article just recently about how humanities was one of the most important, one of the most useful ones. The World Economic Forum just put it out. Um, so you read things like that, which has a headline that you agree with already, um, and and it just said how how that sort of tools you up for le for leadership. So yeah, I think I think it, it has helped. Having said that, I think maybe most of the uh, other entrepreneurs in the room agree that you also as an entrepreneur, know what you're bad at. Um, and then, so, so, so if you are somebody in the humanities, you hire a good engineer um, and make sure that they're your per partner in crime or, or sort of somebody who is very good at holding a clipboard if you're a bit more visionary and things like that. So sort of knowing what you're not good at is almost as important as knowing, you know, getting to know what you're good at. So how did you get from university to the Virgin Group? And a lot of your early roles were in a marketing function. How did you end up in marketing? Uh, yeah, so, so um, I, I, I went, from university, uh, I was came from Scotland down to England, so graduated at twenty, which is quite young for the young there. But I hadn't skipped a year. I wasn't a sort of a child genius or anything. Uh, it was just the way that the birth dates had worked between the Scottish system and the English system. The net product of that, though, was important to me. Was I had a year in hand for my Scottish friends who had a four-year degree, and um, and my uh, English friends who were older going into university. So so I thought I can go around the world for a year and come back at, at 21, the same as everybody else. And that's what I did. So, so I, I went westward uh, for a year. Uh, I left on my dad's 49th birthday, and just like uh, Phileas Fogg, I got back for my dad's birthday on, the 50, on his 50th. Um, and he, none, nobody in my family saw me in that year. And I just went, right, went, went westwards until I got back around. Um, and, and it was quite important to me for like, looking back in a number of different ways, because obviously you see 14 countries, um, it's all the upside if you do it right, you get 16 months of summer as well. Um, if you cross the equator at the right, right, right times. Um, but, but, um, you see, you see, you see, I got a perspective, which I, I, I obviously sort of take to this day. Um, but the other thing is it got me a bit of courage. Um, and the people like McKinsey and, uh, Boston Consulting Group were doing the, the what they call the milk round in the UK, where they come around the fancy hotels and put on, is that better if I hold a bit closer? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's a small room. Who cares? Um, um, you know, so 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 McKinsey and Boston, you know, all the all the kind of the big pairs, you know, you know sort of the, the star employers, so to speak, in my day, uh, would would hire hotels. And I never, I, I went to them for the free food, but I wasn't going to apply because uh, I thought that, that you know they've only got fourteen or fifteen in a year. That's not me. Um, but actually, going around the world, I was thinking, well, if it's not me, who is it? And I applied um, to McKinsey from Australia 
while I was still backpacking. And I said, you know, sort of, I quite like to work in London when I get back, which is obviously slightly outside the normal sort of cycle. Um, but the McKinsey uh, Sydney and, and, and BCG Sydney sort of took me in and, and, and I interviewed there um, almost in my sort of uh, uh, sort of backpacking clothes, um, and they, they luckily sort of said, "Well, you know, London London will interview you when you get back in June." So I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have applied to McKinsey because I, would, I don't think I had anything to offer them. But but going around, I thought maybe I have something after all. And and so in the end, um, yeah, applied and and then interviewed and started in in August. So that's the piece about sort of sort of taking you out then into McKinsey. And I think it was very formative for me as a excuse me a second. At least it's on silent. Um, there we go. <laughs> Um, I was trying to make up, up an excuse to get mine out so I could keep track of the time. So I'm going to there you go. <laughs> now it's a great time to do that. <laughs> there you go. Um, so so um, uh, in terms of in terms of from sort of McKinsey o- o- onwards o- o- onwards, um, I think I, it's it, it was it felt to me like a second degree. Um, and somebody was uh, teasing me earlier about you know sort of uh, you know I've only got my undergrad um, and 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 I felt like the McKinsey two years in retrospect was a little bit like a, a sort of second degree, but it was but as in, in business um he gave me such an interesting uh sort of tour of uh how business works um classic sort of working hard you know sort of uh you know sort of and making yep. sh- uh, you know and anyone who's w- worked in those sort of places knows it knows knows that too so you kind of learn a few things and it knocks a few corners off you um and and then the story you said like well how did they get to virgin the way that mckinsey worked in london was that there was um 15 of us leaving every year in this business analyst program, the graduate program. And there was about 30 alumni of McKinsey around London that wanted this this crop of McKinsey people that, you know, they, they knew how much we didn't know, basically. This two year in sort of early 20s people. So so there's 30 job, you know, basically 30 job opportunities uh, that you have a look through and say, I'd rather do that than do an MBA. And I looked down and the way that I found Virgin was I was looking for something that was like, I could say it, it was the something. So, so a lot of them were like bag carrying to the CEO of the Financial Times or, you know, the executive assistant to the CEO of Sky Broadcasting. And, you know, you're going to do not, you're going to see a lot, but I'm not sure how much you're going to do. And then the Virgin one was really interesting because it said brand manager of Virgin Cola. And I thought, so that's, you can put a the in front of that. It's like, you're actually doing something. You are responsible for the brand of this. Um, and so I went for that one because it was a McKin- there was a McKinsey managing director, um, as in McKinsey alumni guy. He couldn't understand his marketing director because he was a special creative Virgin marketer guy. Um, and so what his plan was, which was uh, an open plan, was if I put a business analyst underneath him, then at least I can get the reports I know I want from this crazy creative marketing director because I've, I've put um, sort of a man, a man underneath or a woman underneath that, they can, that, that I know what they can, they can produce. And, and so that how, that's how it worked. And there was a little mini production line of McKinsey business analysts coming into Virgin this way. Um, and, and, and so that's how we sort of got into the marketing function. I was always interested in the consumer. Consumer. Um, but this was a way of becoming kind of the brand manager yep. um, in a, a way of not having any previous experience. Yep. So before we move on to your last role there in South Africa, were there any big takeaways from your time in Virgin that sort of captured what I think we see from an outsider as an entrepreneurial spirit? Anything you think they did particularly well or differently? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I stayed, I did 10 jobs in 12 years with the Virgin Group. And then it's a bit of a cheat to say it was 12 years because then, uh, you know, helping with the Carbon War Room, that was also him. And then the B team with uh, Paris uh, Climate Talks was also him. So being with with him, in, as in working in some capacity for 17. So I definitely like his values, uh, you know, sort of. And, and I think if it was to something where I think like, well, how does he succeed when others, you know, sort of where others don't, or how, how does he succeed more often? Um, he's written very eloquently, and he's talked about this. So you probably some people in the room n- know already that the material. But the bits that I I've experienced is the the piece that is authenticity. So he, he you know, sort of what you see on the front of the camera is exactly what you see when he gets out off the camera, and he's just in a taxi with you going from A to B. Or my very first uh, one was when I was had to present the marketing campaign for 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 the first Virgin company I was in, and I was invited to his house, 
and presenting the kind of concept boards as they were back then, the foam boards. And, and I was presenting to his socks because his socks were about here and his, you know, it was on his coffee table in his lounge and there were his socks and they were closer to me than anything else. And I was sort of presenting and he's just super relaxed and this is like, well, where's this, you know, so where's this you know, thing going? And he, if he doesn't like it, he tells you. And it's just something very authentic. Everything, everything is him. And, and, and you see him, I think many of you may be seeing him. He's, he's not, he, he's, he's not a super confident public speaker, but he's super confident in who he is. And, and that's what you know, sort of that's what you see. Um, so I, I think that's one of the big, big things. Uh, and then the, the idea that the values were so important, like we knew we were a consumer champion, whichever market we were in, whether it was, you know, taking on soft drinks, we we saw the evil. This is like one thing about Coke Virgin Cola, you know, sort of, and he talks about it, too. But it's like, why did it? Why is it not that great? It's because um, we saw the consumer evil like there was Coke and Pepsi you know, sort of putting 20 brands each in one fridge and then, and then you know, sort of not letting anyone else in the fridge and, and, and taking a fridge away from a shop if, if they saw another person's product in it. That was terrible. But it wasn't a consumer evil that the consumer saw. Yeah. It was a trade evil, effectively. Yeah. Uh, and the consumer didn't see this as an evil. So even though we were thinking we're on, you know, we're, we're fighting for the right thing, we're a consumer champion, and then hence we had a great time and, you know, sort of we had some good moments and some good business successes. Really, it wasn't an enduring business success because the consumer champion piece wasn't there. So I think the bits were version super successful. Consumer champion, there's a fun and service element. I think, I think that, 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 that works best. Um, and then the other bit that he's very good at is he just lets leaders become leaders. He gives things, he, he, he gives things up and he says, I, you know, like, I want somebody to be better at that than me and then I can do something else. And I think that's something that I've kept you know, sort of since then is this idea of like, if you hire somebody for a role then, and, and you think, I don't want somebody too good because then they might be, get jumpy. And, and, and get out of there, um, then that's a completely the wrong way to grow a biz an entrepreneurial business. He, he, he has taught me, I think, like, hire the best person you can, and if they're jumping at your heels, and that's great, because you're hopefully sort of jumping at the next person's heels. And, 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 and th those couple of values sort of stay strong with me, th and they're very common throughout the 10 jobs. Uh, they were, that, was, that, that was common. Okay, so at the end, you finished up at, uh Virgin Mobile, South Africa. I think you faced some challenges there that would be unique in many ways, comparable to the U.S. marketplace. What were the biggest challenges you faced, and how did you address them? Yeah, um, yeah, it was, it, it was a really one of those classic ones where it looked easy from the outside, and, and then that that cliche, you know, the more you know, the more you know you don't know, is just that you just sort of peeling up the the sort of the layers. So I was I was sent across there to. Um, uh, effectively, can you tinker with the marketing, get the marketing sorted? And you've done marketing, Peter, so you know what Virgin wants to do there. And then there's a bit about a vision thing and the team needs to gel. And, and so it's like, well, I've done both of those kind of, not in South Africa, but, you know, sort of, uh, but okay, let's go. And and so I got a, is effectively a promotion of vice president in the US to the CEO position in, the, in South Africa, but it's a much smaller business. Um, and, and, and it just started six weeks post launch. The challenging piece um, was really that the, 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 the technology was sort of held together by cell tape and string, as I say. But you know, sort of, they like I pull up that part of the carpet, and it's like it didn't look good. And then I pull up another part, finance and compliance, that doesn't look good. And, and so in the end, I had a management team um, that was I had to replace ten out of twelve in the course of two years. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a big turnover versus the marketing one, which was the challenge I was given, was almost the easiest one. Because I come in with a marketing background, I see this guy who isn't a marketer in the chief marketing officer role, we have a very short chat, which is, you don't really like this, do you? And he goes, no, you're right. And you're like, what would you think about this position over here? And he goes, cool, I, I want to get out of this. So it was a five minute discussion and my marketing vacancy had been created and I could then hire my person and, and all that sort of stuff. So the, the, the one I was sent down for was the easiest and, and everything else was, was, was harder. The, the hardest piece is, is, I think, is, is creating an aspirational product in a in a, in a in a country that is is has got so many problems, um, the 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 piece that is so enlightening about South Africa. And how many people here have been to South Africa? None. So I can say anything I like. 
fantastic. Uh, I would have said it, all I'm about to say anyway uh, is just uh, I would have looked for some affirmation. Um, the, 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 it's a fascinating country where the 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 good and the bad is of is so obvious. It's on its sleeve as a country. Um, there is this incredible optimism coming out of apartheid. Um, shrugging it off, having one of the most enlightening, enlightened constitutions in the world in 14 official languages, but it's still only a small book. It's a fantastic, sort of lots of positives. And, and when I was there, everything was being built for the World Cup. You know, it's like you could you, you could have a one line business case, you know, saying, you know, sort of, well, the World Cup's coming. So that's why I'm building my hotel or doing this, even though the World Cup's only three weeks long or four weeks long. So it's like this was a business case that got everything done. So things it was just such an, an entrepreneurial and an upbeat country. But then crushing poverty gaps, uh, crushing um, HIV and AIDS uh, problems, six million people out of whatever it was, 50, as uh, the largest a uh, AIDS population in, in the world, I think. Um, and then crushing crushing crime um you know sort of in in, in the uk we are of, often teased in dinner parties for always talking about the weather um and you know sort of it, it will take a while and then the conversation will, will get around to that or we'll break out with a conversation about the weather early just to get the ice broken um and and, and it's true uh, but in south africa the the dinner party conversations were about violent crime happening to either you or one of your immediate relatives and everyone in the six or eight person dinner party had a story that was either them or somebody very close to them. And it wasn't, uh, oh, I got my credit card stolen. It was a five hour ordeal, guns, you know, sort of, or, and worse. Um, and so it, 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 it completely changes your view on life. You become that guy, you know, Jason Bourne, where he goes, do you mean the car behind you or this or that? You just become very aware of your whole surroundings. You never feel safe. And it feels like a sort of flip of the hierarchy of needs where you can have beautifully expensive wine and a game drive, um, but you can't be safe from harm. Or, 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 and I don't mean this from a tourist point of view. Any tourist could get down there is, is lovely, but I mean living there and sort of being in a day-to-day -day environment, walking to work or not, and things like that, it's just, it's, it's just a very different place. So those are the kind of the, 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 kind of the major challenges. Is the sort of, and, then, and then from a business owner point of view, um, the management team, there's, there's, there's a case about sort of managing diversity here, and I'm, I'm not belittling the, the diversity problems here. It's just, again, South Africa has it on its sleeve. So especially for my slash our age, I say, but some people, quite a lot of people younger. Um, so, so somebody my age and say my management team, they all had a pre-apartheid and, and, and transition and post-apartheid experience. Whereas the young contact center people had a, just a post-apartheid life if they're 20. And, and so, so my CFO was a white Afrikaans woman who um, um, was brought up on that side of the struggles. Her ex-husband was secret police um, and she still renewed her gun license every year and drove down from Pretoria in her bulletproof Mercedes. And my chief people officer was a Zulu from the uh, near KwaZulu Natal, and learned about the struggles when he was imprisoned for not having his pass, and that's when he learned about Mandela and kind of you know sort of became one enlightened in terms of you know apartheid's a bad thing, age fourteen or fifteen, and and these two people are the same rank, getting paid the same, and sitting next to each other in 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 the management team, um, and then you've got a uh, chief product officer who looks like Rutger Hauer out of uh, Blade Runner. Um, you know, sort of built, sort of inverted triangle, and he was in national service fighting, in quotes, fighting the communists um, in sort of uh, what, was, what was then is, is now Namibia. And, and they actually thought they were fighting the communists. It's just, it just now post apartheid, they go, geez, I was, you know, sort of, I was cheated by my own government in terms of the mission. And again, he's sitting there next to each other. So there's a managing diversity here, but then there's managing diversity in South Africa has this whole new uh, sort of uh, complexity. So I think it would be applicable here, but you'd see it even highlighted there. What do you think the obligations are for for-profit organizations to have social motivations? And there are some that exist at Virgin. Do you think it can be an advantage? And how do you balance that with profitability? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because it sort of bridges the kind of Virgin of South Africa experience and, and now. I mean... I mean so take the social obligations. The, the, I think some of them are very contextual. Uh, so so this, uh, keeping on the South Africa front for a second, HI, HIV uh, and, and AIDS is, is, is ubiquitous. And then we have in Virgin, 
zero uh, percent challenge, and that was our social uh, group mission. To say like we have zero percent new transmission, zero percent deaths, zero percent mother to child transmission. That's our zeros for AIDS. Um, and then I thought that was great and cute when we're in the U.S. I mean, it's like yes, of course we should be zero. And then I get there. And I inherited a questionnaire where it was 15% of my 450 person team uh, bl had blind tested positive for HIV. So they didn't know they were HIV, but we knew 15% of them were. Um, and that was a test rate of 90%. So, so, so the 10% that refused to even do a blind study, you'd imagine more than 15% of them had HIV. Um, so, so, so the social aspect there, I think, uh, to, to answer your question, is like it's contextual. So say we're in New Haven, you, 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 can, you can't be a New Haven business without picking a New Haven issue. And so in South Africa, we couldn't be a South African business without sort of championing something like 0% you know, sort yeah. of for, 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 for HIV as, as a noble goal, if not an, uh, an immediately attainable goal. More broadly, though, I think in terms of the, the challenges we now face as, and as entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs and, and, and things like that, is, is like, it's, it's all great if, if we as, a, as entrepreneurs go, well, I want to fix that social problem. Therefore, I'm going to be a social entrepreneur. Um, and, and go for it. And clearly you then say yes to your question. But I, I, I think the, the minimum piece for a business that is, on the, is, is not a social business is like, am I not being on the problem side of the ledger? Like, am I, it, so it's, or am I at least minimizing it? So whether it's emissions, fossil fuels, are we doing what we can to reduce? Um, it, and if it's on the social side, I'm hopefully not creating a social problem. I might be, you know, sort of not yet, you know, as core to my business, creating a social benefit, but at least I'm, I, I'm not creating a social problem. So I think the minimum piece is, is how can I minimize my downside? on the planet. I mean, when we get to the sort of infu the, the sort of later times with like net zero as an environmental concept, I think is an important one and not, uh, but if you take it as a social, not everyone can get to get to sort of supremely positive, but if they can minimize it, then there are some s people that will really champion it, fly the flag, and then we'll be a, a net, will be a zero poverty world. Um, but I, but I think the key, the key responsibility we have is to work out, you know, sort of that piece about what, you know, what can we do with what we have where we are? So moving on to your time working uh, fighting climate change, how did the Carbon War Room come into existence? Uh, yeah, uh, I think like many Virgin businesses, uh, it came into existence. You know, the Virgin logo came into into existence with a a, a, a scribble on a napkin. So that V is is it was a red pen. Like he, uh, Richard grabbed it apparently and just sort of said it was something like that. Um, and 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 conversations, um, uh, you know, sort of were the ones off agenda normally created the business rather than the on agenda. So. The, the bit that I saw, and this isn't all the whole story of how Carbon Mormon is formed, but, but uh, like the, the, my personal piece on it, looking on it, was uh, the Virg Virgin created the CEO's gathering uh, in, on Necker Island, so it's not a bad place to have a, a, a management retreat. Um, you're there, and, and his agenda stops at 1 p.m. So all the CEOs from around the Virgin Group, you have to stop or work at one and then socialize for the rest of the day. Um, and you're allowed to bring your other half. So um, it's, 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 it's a nice, relaxing and relaxing time, certainly for, for your other half, if not for you, all the time. And it was in one of those downtime sessions where Richard and others were thinking, what can we do with this problem of climate change? Um, why, why is it not being solved? Why is it intractable? Copenhagen's coming up in 2009, but it doesn't feel like it's all positive, and obviously that turned out to be the case. Um, so what can we do about it? And, and, and the good thing about it, and I think this is an entrepreneurial lesson that I, I kind of hold, hold on to, is like, well, what is our unique asset? We as a bunch of virgin people, and Richard in particular, do on this. And it was about harnessing entrepreneurship uh, to combat climate change. And, and so the idea of the carbon war room was hatched there. And I think Al Gore also, um, Richard, uh, uh, attributes quite a lot of credit to R Al Gore knocking on Richard's door at the right time with a strong message saying, you have a responsibility to do something, Richard, in your position. And then around that time was our, conf you know, a bit later was our conference saying, right, well, how do we do this? And the name carbon war room stuck. We couldn't ever find a better name for it. But that idea of a sort of wartime mobilization rather than any other war analogies, it was more the kind of 
Clinton-esque war room of like getting uh, one from each of the heads of, of, of the army, the navy, etc., and then getting it pointing us all in the same direction. But how could we do that for entrepreneurship? So the idea was hatched. There was a let's do a one-page memo, just like I think maybe uh, uh, how many entrepreneurs are here? Like who's doing business? Yeah, so vast majority. So you probably started with an idea and then a one-page memo and then a one-page memo becomes a PowerPoint and then, oh, you need to do an Excel, make sure the numbers are right. It's exactly how the carbon warm existed. It started off with, that's a good idea around a fireplace. Uh, somebody should write a one-page memo on that. Um, somebody should really do a PowerPoint on that. Somebody should really do an Excel on that because we've got some funders coming. And and um, the one-page memo sat there for a year, and then I went back to South Africa, and then the same little group around Richard said, remember that idea we had a year ago? It needs the PowerPoint and the Excel. Um, and so I came back to London saying, well, I'm definitely up for that, um, and, and create, uh, created them as a sort of launch director. Yep. And then, uh, unfortunately, there was another meeting in Necker Island, um, and uh, terrible. They, they, they're terrible. So some climate funders got together uh, on Richard's, in Richard's home with that PowerPoint and Excel, and uh, they said basically, well, we're ready for funding it, but we need somebody to do the dirty work, like do the grunt work while this becomes something. Um, and 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 I was there as I was there at the time. I think that's pretty good timing. Yeah. Um, what were the biggest wins that you had while at Carbon War Room, and why were they successful ways to try to reduce climate change? Um, I think uh, so, so. I think the couple couple of wins the, the, the couple of wins. They're exciting from an entrepreneur perspective because we had entrepreneurs in our sites to be the main winners, uh, obviously the planet to be the ultimate winner. But our kind of target market was like, how can we make entrepreneurs more successful where they currently aren't? Um, when the economics should say they should be successful. Um, I, I mean, how many people here have heard of the like McKinsey cost curve? Uh, it, it, the key piece is like if you're able to sort of draw climate change on a napkin um, or how to solve climate change on a napkin, well, this is something that drove us as an as a, as a, as a, as a organization. Imagine an x-axis sort of across this gray line here, which is like the number of tons of CO2 we can't emit anymore, like the number of CO2 we, we must mitigate. And then on the x-axis is the cost of, t of not emitting that CO2. Then what, what McKinsey did is if this is the X axis, the McKinsey did a, did a curve with, with lots of little strips. Um, and the lots of little strips were everything from insulating buildings through to building solar through to um, coal capture and sequestration on power stations, um, carbon capture. Um, and obviously each one of these strips got you some the way along to what you needed to mitigate and it, and it either cost something or didn't. And what we th were mystified by, by this S curve was it not the principle of it. Um, it's now been rejuvenated by others uh, like the Global Econ uh, Commission on Economy and Climate and others, and it's flipped to being a, a benefit curve rather than a cost curve. We weren't mystified by the fact that you had all these things and, and you could solve the planet's problems, but you needed every single piece to do it. What was mystifying is why is there a left side of the cost curve? Why is there tons of stuff that's below the x-axis? As in, it's saving somebody money, it's making some profit but it's not being done. Why doesn't the kind of the solution curve for climate change start in the middle? And then we just have to argue as a set of governments and companies, who's gonna pay for all this stuff? Why was there stuff that is gonna make somebody money and it wasn't happening? And, th and, and, and that's what fascinated us and actually still fascinates me is this like, you know, sort of how do you get to the market failures? So the biggest successes were kind of drilling into that sort of left side where it's like we could, the, the planet could make or save a ton of cash, but isn't. Um, the biggest one probably is, is, is the shipping industry that we, that we found and, and then had some success on. Um, I mean, 95% of the world's goods goes by sea. Uh, so, so most of the businesses in this room are rely. Well, all of them probably are rely. You're relying on shipping, whether you know it or not. Um, but it's almost like the unseen industry. It's it sort of it sits in the background. You can't touch it. Um, um, and what was interesting about it was is the sixth largest country in terms of emissions, um, in between Germany and Japan in terms of emissions. But um, but it was, it was a, a, but much dirtier than even those countries. So one of the largest ships in the world was 50 million cars worth of sulfur oxides. So only 15 of the largest ships in the world is the entire world stock of cars.
in terms of sulfur oxides that cause acid rain. So there's this incredibly polluting industry, but most uh, sort of depressingly for the planet at the moment, but then interestingly for entrepreneurs, is that the fuel savings could be up to t between 20 and 75%. There's this massive swing, like, like ships should be saving money as well as, um, um, you know, sort of as well as helping the climate. And so what we found was the market failures, there was lots of technologies that could go on ships. And so entrepreneurs were making these brilliant pieces of kit, whether it's the special paint that uh, resists barnacles and makes a ship slide through the water. One made a bubble machine that forced bubbles underneath the hull. Um, so it was like ball bearings uh, and sort of, you know, sort of making the, the ship glide better, software to avoid storms, 60, 70 technologies. So some great stuff out there, but they weren't being bought. And they weren't being bought, we found, and this is where our sort of our work sort of took off, um, we found it then were for two key market failures. There was an information problem. It was hard to tell a clean ship from a dirty ship. Um, so whether you were on Maersk, the supply side, saying, here's my ship, it's cleaner than the rest, or whether you're on Cargill's side, saying, I've got my cargo to put on ships and I can't find a clean one, you couldn't do it with the poor information. And then the other piece was 70% of the fuel in the industry is paid for by the cargo owner, not by the ship owner. So why would I, as a ship owner, effectively spend lots of money on kit if somebody else is going to get the benefit. And then because of the first market failure, nobody's going to tell anyway. So those were the two things that were stopping that. And it, it stops them to this day around the planet on buildings as well. Landlord tenant issues you may have heard of, you know, sort of where, you know, sort of if the landlord says, well, it's not, it's not my electricity bill that's going to go down if I retrofit. And the tenant goes, it's not my building to retrofit. So something that would have saved money for the planet is, is, is not done because the risk and rewards in the wrong place. So what we did was um, we created an index um, and, and to solve the information problem, shippingefficiency.org. It it's basically saying you can put any ship in the world's fleet into uh, uh, a tool and for free up pops the rating, like an energy star rating for your fridge. You could get an energy star rating for a ship. Yeah. Um, and we launched that in Cancun in the middle of the climate uh, negotiations to much fanfare. That's when having Richard Branson is really handy. Uh, you can get column inches uh, more, with, with, with more uh, certainty than if, you, than if you didn't have him. Um, and, um, and, and so we launched, launched, launched the index and then we nudged the, um, the buy side, the, the cargoes of this world that were actually effectively paying for the fuel bill. And, and we said, why don't you stop using dirty ships? It'll save you money. So then and, and this is maybe an, a, a, to extend it's an entrepreneurial lesson for me now in my new company and, and potentially for others. We decided to not effectively take the, the headline and, we, and, and the headline in the Financial Times was Cargill and three others dump F and G grade vessels. And so this in the Financial Times, so we weren't even quoted, but the idea of the shockwaves through the shipping market that said, you know, sort of cargo owners care, they're looking up the index and they're not using it if it's a dirty ship. And so these little pieces of acupuncture have, have sort of sort of changed the shipping market uh, or helped change it. Let's, let's not overblow our, our sort of our effect. But over 30% now of the non-container fleet use an index in order to pick what ships they're on. Um, and so that's probably the, the, the key one. We then imported a finance mechanism from buildings. Um, um, which basically allowed for financiers who want to get rich to pay for the technology. Entrepreneur then gets a, gets a customer who's going to pay full price for his technology. The ship owner gets the technology for free. And then the cargo owner who's paying the fuel bill gets a lower fuel bill, a little bit lower fuel bill now, and a much bigger lower fuel bill later. So everyone on the table makes money. Uh, which they didn't before, yeah. and the the word climate change is not, or words climate change are never mentioned because they don't need to be mentioned. It's all about money that's been left on the table. How important do you think it is to make it a purely economic issue when that's possible? Um, it's a great question, especially in this country. Um, I mean, I think I think the economic piece is the piece that's going to make it quickest. I, I also think um, when you so there is a great uh, study called New Climate Economy came out with a report that said 94% of those things I was talking about on the curve, so 94% of them um, will grow the economy and reduce emissions at the same time. So really, if you're thinking about sitting opposite a climate denier on a flight, I, which you know used to happen, and you know when I was working for Garmore, it's like, well, we're only going to be arguing about six percent. So don't worry. Like, like let's let's talk about like, like, and then and then after that, you know, like there'll be a whole new cost curve for it. Even that six percent will probably be profitable. So I think the the, the profit piece, it, it sounds a bit 
sort of, you know, sort of harshly capitalist to say, well, it has to work that way. And I don't think that's the full answer, but it does get rid of a lot of arguments yeah. um, and it does speed up the change. Um, the other piece, though, I, I, I'm very inspired by is somebody like Paul Pullman's drive in Unilever, where it's the moral leadership from the top that says that isn't soft leadership. It isn't sort of let's go 100% renewable energy and then let's work out how much it costs me. Yep. He drives into the business. We need to be 100% renewable energy. So work out how to make that financially lucrative for us or work out how to make it financially viable. So, and I think that's the, that's the key. So speaking of market failures then, which you tried to address in the shipping industry, you're also trying to tackle that with time for good. So can you sh sort of share where that idea came from and how the business model works? Uh, yeah, so, so, so um, um, the work on, on carbon war room probably inspired a lot of it. Um, um, the, the idea of the courage, like the shipping industry example, where I thought a small team with a little bit of money can actually make a, a huge amount of positive damage to a big problem. Um, because, you know, sort of this, the, the shipping and the island nations and the other things we worked on, it was always small team, small money. But if you knew where to push, then that was really interesting. So that gave me the courage to say, geez, you can get something done with a small team. Um, the other thing that inspired me in, in Carbon Warren was one of the funders, the Dutch Postcode Lottery. Um, unless somebody's from Holland, unlikely to have heard of it, but the Dutch Postcode Lottery has got this amazing business model where 40% of Holland play, uh, th play the lottery, the, the Dutch Postcode Lottery, by direct debit. So incredibly lucrative uh, uh, lottery that this, this company runs, but 50% of the revenue goes to charity. So they have these huge sort of regular uh, events where just millions and millions is given away to charity and the lottery buyers know it and see it and feel great about it. Yeah. Meanwhile, direct debit every month, out it goes. Um, and, and I thought that's really interesting where it's just the, the revenue model to good causes is so knitted in. It's not like a, it's even better than the Tom's shoes, the buy one and somebody over here gets a pair of shoes. It's like it's, it's ingrained in the product and I love that. And then the last piece, which is like, well, where is the market failure that I wanted to focus sort of the next phase of life on was time itself. I just thought climate change is one of the biggest market failures I've, I, I had ever seen. But the biggest market failure that, that I, I've seen and still seen, seen now, you know, hence I'm still work, you know, working on it with a passion, is time itself. You know, sort of it's the most precious non-renewable resource we have. Um, it's, you know, sort of it is running out. Um, it, the mega trends on where it's going are terrifying if you want to think about it in a, in a different way to climate. Um, in that, um, you know, so those, how many people here feel overloaded by their inbox? A few? Yep, great. Um, yep, so, so busy audience. Um, so, you know, so, so that feeling, um, that feeling is um, unfortunately not only not going away, but going to get a lot worse in reality um, because of underlying trends. You, you sort of, on the demand side, population, it took us thousands of years to get to the first 3 billion people in the world, 1960, and then only another 55 years to add another 4 billion. And then you, more data is produced every year than the cumulative stock of data ever. Um, and there's just no way to hide anymore. So, so the demand on everybody's attention is going crazy and exponential. Meanwhile, the supply of your attention is fixed. You have to get some sleep and you can't multitask. So the supply of attention fixed, demand going crazy. I thought this is an interesting market failure. So that's how Time for Good came out because I was working as the climate guy for uh, uh, sort of Richard Branson and this uh, other gentleman, Jose Mira Figueres, another inspiring leader, and thinking I'm, the, I'm getting all their climate emails um, and, and I'm getting the forwards saying, please, can you deal I, on top of my own? And I thought, well, I'm getting 500 a day and getting to 100. Uh, and I'm and I'm stretched. But then, what is Richard Branson doing? Because he's got twenty issues at least that are as full as climate change, and I'm only one of the one of his climate guys. So I thought this is really broken. So that's what I set out to solve. Yep. So could you explain a little bit about how the business model works, uh, both the platform you're building, but also the other work you're doing helping business leaders yep. prioritize? So 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 time for time for good is is effect effectively trying to maximize leaders' time for good. And it's it's sort of built from that passion that says like can I solve this market failure for more than just me and, and what what a better place this this could be. Um, it's built on the concept of the jar of time. Anyone 
heard of that, the, the jar of time or jar of life, uh, one or two. Um, it's basically imagine a really big vase uh, in between us on the stage. Um, and that, 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 that jar or that vase is, is your time on this planet. And so it's fixed. And in terms of your length of your life, it's, it's fixed. It might be unknown to you, but it's still fixed. And you can put rocks, pebbles, or sand in the jar. Um, if you put the rocks in first, then we put the pebbles in, then the pebbles sort of have a way of filling around the edges of the rocks. And then if you put the sand in, then it's got a way of filling around the edges of the pebbles and the rocks. And so our big stock of rocks, pebbles, and sand that were on the side all fit in your jar of life. But if you did it the other way around and you put your sand in first and then the pebbles, then you'd be left with maybe half your rocks sitting outside your jar. And that would be a very sad uh, sort of state of affairs for your life or for your entrepreneurial business is if you've been caught dealing with sand all the time and you've not dealt with your rocks first. So this, um, I, and there's stuff on YouTube uh, on this, the, there's real professors doing this and uh, in front of real classes and things like that. It's easy to find as, a, as an analogy, but it really struck me as a powerful way of getting across my, 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 my two solutions effectively. So I formed the Time for Good group, even though when I, I named it, it was only one of me, um, I thought it is a group of solutions because um, there's two things, as you alluded to. One is to help leaders with their rocks. Ever since Virgin Mobile South Africa, where I, one of the things I did to bind the team was the team helped write my job description in a, in an away day. My, find my rocks, define my rocks for me. I obviously said I had my own opinions. And then they knew that that sheet of, 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 of Pete's rocks are, are coming down to me in my order, whether it's a CTO, whether it's a CFO, whatever. So ever since then, I've been I've been running or helping to run organizations where you're very, very intentional about your rocks and how you're moving them. Um, and so that's become a product where I, I sit with leaders, entrepreneurs, startups, um, and, and big companies. And, and uh, the, my most recent client is a 70-year-old NGO. Um, and, and, and sitting with their teams and saying, well, intentionally, how do you get the rocks to be sort of very clear, very known, and then you've got clear targets. And then you drive that change through your organization. You can also drive it through your life. Um, there's, you know, sort of, I think what's very empowering for quite a lot of leaders is that their to-do list, they might be very good at work, but then is it so good for getting the t their own personal taxes in on time? Is it so good for spending quality time with family and looking after your health? And, and, and I help some leaders now get all their rocks, all of life's rocks into a sheet and say, no matter how complicated your life, Life, we can get your to-do list uh, on a page. So that's the rock solution. Um, the pebble solution is the, the problem. The the problem, and I, I and this is the sort of the scalable platform we've built. Is the idea is that as you get more senior and more known, you basically get more pebbles that you uh, didn't know you you'd created. You get you become better known for a thing, and more people want to get hold of you. Um, and so take Richard Branson and mentoring, or Richard Branson and startups, for instance, was the two sort of examples. It's like I just need 15 minutes of your time, and that's all I need, and I bonded with you at a conference. Unfortunately, 20,000 people bonded with him over the last month and also sent him the same email wanting the same 15 minutes. So I thought that's the, that's the thing I want to solve for. So basically, it's allowing a leader to say, I'm sorry, it, I'm really busy, but please see my profile for when you might be able to find a time to chat. Um, we take the pebble, the, 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 incoming, the incoming email or incoming request to the time for good profile for the leader. And it clearly shows how the leader wants to spend their time, what they'd like to talk about. Yes, I would like to mentor, but I only like mentoring at 7 a.m. on Mondays at my favorite Starbucks. And the next slot that's available is in two weeks time. And for a charitable donation, you can have it. And so I basically created a marketplace where there wasn't a market before. Um, in addition to helping the leader think through, when is that pebble time good for you? When, when is it good for you to be mentoring? When is it good for you to receiving new ideas? So whether it's Richard uh, with a new business idea, whether it's an, uh, a diplomat with mentoring the next generation, whether it's a 
um, you know, sort of out, my my fellowship and out of offers out of uh, office hours time for Yale people that want just some extra time when I'm not even in Yale. Um, it doesn't really matter what the thing is or what the price is. It's a charity hurdle to get into my time when you know it's not a rock of mine. It might be a rock of yours, but it's not a rock. Of, uh, it's not a rock of mine. And so jump into the hurdle. So the the, the idea is it, it's it's a profile um, that puts ninety percent of the money that that person donates to charity, seventy percent to the cause of the leader's choice and the buyer wanting into my t in, into the leader's time at 20 percent to their charity of their cause cool that's really cool um i think it's time for us to open it up to q a if anybody has any questions it's a good question uh get, great question um in in i suppose what i'm saying is i'm not there to help it as in, as in, you probably do enough of it yourself. Um, but there are some, uh, when we're sort of training with teams and things like that, there are some sort of little hacks and tools to try and minimize sand. Um, some computers are quite good at sort of creating sort of uh, focus type tools. Um, but the, but uh, no, I don't, I don't tend to help with that. But, but even just people being aware of what are, you know, like this is a rock, this is a pebble, this is a sand. So what I've also found in some, uh, some clients and partners where the management's team starts talking in, in that language, then well, let's go back to the rock, shall we? Like you, you've been talking about this for, for way too long. Um, so sometimes the awareness is enough to help. But I, I, I don't really help them with that, though. dismissing that the whole, oh, climate change is a myth. So do you think it'd be up to people with, uh, I guess, deep pockets, like billionaires, to essentially push the change themselves? Um, yeah, I think, I think like, uh, where you're saying where the push has been, when it when the economics are less clear and where it is now where the economics is more clear i think the answer would be different so so back when you know sort of if you think of two other two other curves which i'm going to metaphorically draw on the same whiteboard here one is a red or brown squiggly upward uh price which is the price of fossil fuels and the price of fossil fuels are is going to is getting uh it, progressively up but also volatile and it's getting harder and dirtier to find those fossil fuels and if you don't believe that now you might believe it in the 10 year horizon 20 year horizon meanwhile clean technology is a green slope that's coming down and smooth and quite aggressively down and there's some great d of e charts and others saying well this is this is coming down and it's 50 60 percent cheaper than it was even in 2008 so most people are now seeing that these are going to cross. There's a squiggly upward red dirty curve, and there's a smooth downward green curve, and they're going to cross in just about every sector, in just about every geography at some point. So then it's a case of, well, where do you put your money um, in terms of when do you believe that crossover is going to happen? Now, when we're far away from the crossover, there is more of a government role to say, well, how do I smooth the transition towards this? And it should be governments and regulations and adventurous billionaires proving that some island technology works on their rich guy's island before we take it to um, uh, a poor island. And actually, we did that in, a, in, a, in one where we call them RGIs, rich guy's islands. And we said, um, so, so why doesn't Richard and, you know, sort of, the, you know, Sergi and, uh, and, and, and Larry, et cetera, why don't they try it on theirs first? And then once that technology is proven out, then St. Lucia, with a GDP per person of $6,000, then we know it works for them. So there is a role for billionaires and governments when, it's, when the crossover hasn't happened. But the interesting thing in most uh, industries now is, is that this crossover looks inevitable and looks close. And so the money is changing. And then when effectively the world agrees, like Paris, um, that we've got to get there. We've got to get not only to the crossover, we've got to get to the other side of the crossover and quick then it's amazing how capital is basically a flick of the tail. It might not be the first to move, but it moves very quickly. So we had the fear of the environmental movement pre-Paris was um, the, you know, sort of all these little NGOs funded by coal and Peabody and all this sort of stuff. Post-Paris, money wanted to come out of coal. 
and they, they, they left them. And there was, I think, 175 bankruptcies in 2016 in oil, in oil and coal, basically because capital didn't want to hold the bag anymore. They saw the crossover coming. The world had agreed that the crossover should come. And then, therefore, it's going to happen. So uh, it's a very long answer to say, you know, sort of billionaires, yes, but only now in very sort of places, in the riskier bits where you say, well, you can play with that technology on your island. And then when it's ready, the rest of the world can have it. Most of the mainstream technology now has moved, where it's now it's a when, not an if. No, oh, thanks for inviting. When it comes to passion, do you think that you find your passion or, your, or does your passion find you? That's a great question. Because I also, the one of the things I do love and I get very passionate about is the executive fellowship at Yale is helping students find that. Um, and so whether they are green startups and social startups or part of the, there's a collaborative of 10 centers um, and programs around Yale. We've come together under entrepreneurship across Yale.com if anyone is affiliated. But to find effectively, once if they're getting close to their passion or they want to tour other people's passions or they want to find it, then you know, sort of how, how can they get there? So your idea is like, if, firstly, personally, I think it's, uh, I've always been focused about being as passionate as I can about what I'm doing. And then it, co it sort of coalesces. And so for instance, maximizing leaders' time for good has really been sort of the piece that sort of um, come together over the last few years where I think it, it, it's something very deep for me where I said, when I see change in somebody else that I've cre helped create, that's incredibly exciting. It's almost like, that's a reason to be alive. And it's almost like it's a touching, I'm solid now because like th that person's changed and they're off in a different direction. That's a really great reason to be here. And then I thought, what if I can do that at a scalable level where there's a tool that helps leaders change? And then whether you can go from a one-on-one -on -one in a class at Yale, like a little clinic, to like trying to make a workshop out of the same thing, then that's really exciting. Or then to a MOOC or a video or whatever it is. So, so in that sense, I think both of those pieces has, has found me on my current passion, the maximizing you know, the leader's time for good. I kind of was quite fuzzy about it a few years ago, and I've got tighter and tighter on it and lost a few words here and there over time. In terms of the people that I'm trying to help, I think that's the vision. That I think that's the zigzag too. I think it's 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 almost wrong to sit there and go. Well, you know, so like the passion is going to come in the door, and likewise, it's also. I think you know it, it's going to be just as hard to walk through life going. I'm I'm going to keep looking for my passion here and here and keep, but not reflecting. I think quite often I find that um, the people that I'm chatting to, they can get to the passion if they reunite the brain and the gut. Um, I, th I think a lot of elite educations, um, n not just this one, uh, you know, sort of in the time we're in, but you know, sort of around the world, you kind of almost, almost sort of taught the separation now to trust your new intellect that you've just found and you've just invested a, a, a lot of money in. But in fact, the real world thrives on gut instinct. And, and, the, and, and if you can keep the conversation going, then I think that's what's really powerful. And that's where you find your passion because you, I think m m most of you probably come out of meetings or moments where both things have happened. You've come out and there's a niggle, there's a knot in your stomach and you don't know what it is. And, and sometimes, uh, uh, and, and this might be, you, you, sort of, you just brush it on the carpet and say, oh well, on to the next thing, I'm an entrepreneur, I have to bounce on. But if you don't get that, that, that'll stay there and you'll create more of them. But if you just pause for a minute and go, what is that niggle, what is that niggle? Oh, is, he said this. And I don't, and I really hated that in the meeting. Or she said this, and it really hurt my feelings. Got it. And then you can move on. Meanwhile, the opposite is to your question. I really believe is like when you come out of a site when you're in flow, and you just think that's it. Like I, 110, percent I'm on it, and I change. You know, I bent the arc of the universe there. That was amazing, and it was with a team or whatever. Then have a conversation again. Like go off on the beach or the hills or whatever, and go. What was magical about that? And was it the thing I was doing, or was it this problem I was trying to solve, or was it both, or was it the people I was with? And then as an entrepreneur, if you can unite all of those together, it's the idea, it's the problem, it's the people, and, and then, then you found your passion. You can look back and go, oh, there it was. But I think you got, you got to sort of zigzag between the two of your question. Then we have one last question. Yeah, 
uh, great question to end on because that's an easy one for me. Um, uh, and it's probably easy for every single entrepreneur in the room. It's like, what's worked well? What's worked badly? What's worked well? Um, um, let's see. I, or, or let's start with what, what, what's worked badly. It's, 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 it's a quote, a quote's clever idea. And if somebody, if somebody, like I've tried to solve a market failure of time, and, and normally I'm in the room and somebody says, um, uh, oh, that's that's amazing. How did you think of that? And you can give them as much or as little of the backstory as, as you think they want to hear. Um, and, and But then I had to get in the room. And then they, they still have a problem kind of translating, going, oh, I need it. And so it's like, but I've solved the problem of 20,000 of your emails, or I've solved the problem of, you know, sort of all those pebbles of time trying to get into your calendar. And they don't, they can't quite uh, get it. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, I, you, you could say, oh, it's like they don't understand it yet, therefore they need to understand. But really, as a marketer and as an entrepreneur, you know, it's like my product's not right yet. You know, like, like I've still got to keep going here. And so I've got a handful of leaders that love it, but I don't have critical mass of lead, or, or I don't have a, a door that's kind of got fist marks in it because you know, sort of everyone's beating down my door to be, to, to be next. I've got a nice pipeline and, and, and I've got a, a lovely quality of leaders. So it feels like who's shred the outliers? Malcolm Gladwell, a few, few people. But I, I still feel like it's the Beatles in the basement in Hamburg, like dingy bars. It's not out, like, like I'm, it's doing good work. Um, and, and I'm loving the people that are doing it and, lo and loving the people that are using it, but it's, but it's hard. Like, like I think I meant probably many of this, the, 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 the harder than I thought, th thought it would be. Um, um, I, I also, there's, there's the, the cliche Groucho Marx, you know, sort of I wouldn't be a member of a club that would have me as a member. It's almost like if a leader has time to talk to me, then I can't really help that leader. If they don't have time to talk to me, it's then, then I can really help them a lot, but then I can't talk to them. Um, so it's an, interesting, it's, it's an interesting target market to try and get to, you might imagine. Um, so, so, so that's the piece that's sort of you know, less well. So I wouldn't even say less well. It's just like slower, slower than I thought, I, I thought it would be. The thing that's worked best is, is I always thought I have to consult. I, I wanted to consult to bootstrap. I wanted to self-finance uh, rather than seek external capital until it got traction. Because the model relies on some really famous people that I'm working on. Um, you know, some of which you know be mentioned here, like but you know, so I'm hoping for some famous customers, and then it'll be worth a lot, or you know, to, to everybody, including the whole world, you know, like uh, and deliver good to the world. But until then, for most venture capitalists, it's a nice PowerPoint. So I needed to, I knew I wanted to self-finance it from the start until it was sort of solid. Um, and had traction. Um, so I thought the consulting business would be my old carbon war room net zero stuff. And, and then here would be my kind of time for good clever platform. And then eventually I'd be able to taper down the net zero consulting and, 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 and dial up the, the, um, uh, the platform. But what's brilliant about it is, is that like, as I become more sort of self-aware to your point earlier about the passion, about intentional use of time and my potential positive impact in helping leaders realize what they can do with their time. I've backed into a whole new customer group that goes, I love your stuff about the pebbles, but can you help me with my rocks first? I don't know how to manage this bit and I don't know how to drive change through my organization or I'm just an entrepreneur and I've never done this before. Can you help me get my head around my business and put it into some nice rocks and get me to drive it through my team? I say, yeah, sure. I mean, I've done that for years. That's great. So it's, it's, what's fantastic is my consulting has almost accidentally sort of veered back in. So now thematically, um, maximizing leaders' time for good unites both the consulting and the, uh, um, uh, the the rock solution and the pebble solution are now together as if they always were, but they weren't. They kind of uh, I had to try to accidentally teach some leaders uh, in order so that they could understand the other side. Unfortunately, I think it's time for us to let you go. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. Great, thank you. Thank you.